attention in case. You can notice that flowers are so big that one flower will have more than one type of pollinator on it. Okay, you can maybe have three or four species of bee on a single sunflower head. So this can be a way of taking a census of the pollinators in your area. In this episode of Voices from the Field, INCAT Sustainable Agriculture Specialist Mike Lewis offers up a primer on pollinators with Dr. Tom Webster of Kentucky State University. Dr. Webster teaches classes and does research on the science of bees, including bee disease, and does extension work with beekeepers around Kentucky. Mike and Dr. Webster begin with the basics, talking about the nature of pollen and the role of various pollinators, bees, and other species. They also discuss the pollinators on Mike's farm, particularly their role in buckwheat and sunflower production. The recording has a few technical issues, but the conversation is well worth it. Let's listen. Hello, this is Mike Lewis from the NCAT Northeast office, and uh, I'm excited to, to be here with you all today to talk about pollinators. Uh, they play an active and vital role in natural ecosystems and in managed agriculture systems. Uh, experts estimate that the value of pollinated crops in the United States exceeds $30 billion, making pollinators an extremely important partner in our food system. Over the past few decades, native pollinator and managed honeybee populations have been in significant decline. Scientists and researchers attribute the decline of pollinator populations to several different complex and interconnected issues, including habitat loss and increased reliance on pesticides in our agricultural production systems. A few weeks ago, I was touring the new um, Kentucky State University Soil Science Lab in Frankfort, Kentucky, and I happened to run into my guest today, Dr. Tom Webster, and in a very brief conversation, I learned so much that we asked him to do this podcast with us today. Uh, Dr. Webster, if you just can introduce yourself, that would be great. Sure. I'm here at Kentucky State University in the College of Agriculture, and I do teaching, research, and extension work. And my specialty is honeybees, especially diseases of honeybees. Um, I teach a class in apiculture, which is the science of bees, and I do extension work mainly with beekeepers around the state of Kentucky. Well, thank, I'm so excited that I, I ran into you because we started talking about one of my favorite crops, buckwheat, and I'm really excited to have you share your knowledge with us today. Um, one of the things that, um, that I find personally, when my knowledge gets more evolved on a topic, um, it becomes a lot easier for me to forget the basics. So I'm, I'm just hoping that you could start at the beginning for us. Um, here in Kentucky, when most of us think about um, pollen, we immediately start thinking allergies, right? So if you could just tell us what, what is pollen and why is it important? Yeah. Pollen is essentially um, plant sperm. It's, uh, it's the way that flowering plants reproduce. Now, of course, not all plants have flowers, but um, those that do uh, have to have a way to spread their gametes, their, their DNA, amongst each other, just as animals mate and share their DNA when they produce offspring, maybe chipmunks, maybe people, whatever. Plants also share their DNA to produce new plants of the same species. And so plants, flowering plants may be male or female or both hermaphrodites. And either way, some of them have to be those that produce the male gametes and some that produce the female gametes. And so then there has to be a way for um, them to uh, mate essentially, but since plants can't get up and walk around, there has to be some mechanism for the pollen to get from one plant to another, or sometimes from between flowers on the same plant. So there's two ways. One is if there's some kind of an animal, such as a bee, that can carry the pollen from one flower to another, uh, or it could be a butterfly or a bat could carry the pollen. The other way is wind, and many plants uh, shed pollen that blows around through the air, and some of us then have hay fever, bad pollen allergies, because uh, trillions of pollen grains are blowing through the air. Some of them get to the female parts of the plants, and some of them end up in our noses, and, and so that's how uh, plants uh, reproduce, either by an animal transferring the pollen or by wind.
And that's really helpful. So you mentioned a little bit, um, you know, m most of us, when we think about pollinators, we think about bees and butter butterflies, but it's not just that, right? I mean, I, I'm picking, you know, things off my kids and animals all day long. So what other types of animals are, are pollinators? Okay. Um, most of the pollinators are insects because um, they can... Um, be available in great numbers and, and most of these insects can fly and so they can very quickly go from flower to flower. So we think first of all about the many species of bees. There are thousands of species of bees, not just the honeybee. And all of the bees in America, in, the no in North America, are native to this region uh, except the honeybee which has been introduced from Europe primarily. And, uh, but the other animals that pollinate are flies, uh, some beetles, some, um, in some cases, bats are important pollinators, not so much in, in, uh, in the United States, but in the tropics, bats are very important pollinators. Um, and even some mammals, I mean, I've heard about monkeys that are going around through the tropical jungles, drinking the nectar out of the flowers up in the trees, and then they go to flower to flower to flower, and then their fuzzy faces transfer <laughs> the pollen. Sounds so, like a really fun research study. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it does sound like a fun research study. So, um, so mostly insects, um, a few others, hummingbirds can be important pollinators. Uh, some of the flowers that have long, deep corollas and that are red are hummingbird flowers. In fact, if you notice, our hummingbird feeders are usually red because that's the color that attracts hummingbirds. Moths are sometimes uh, important pollinators. Moth pollinated flowers are usually white because moths fly at night and they, they look for that white color on the flower. So there's a lot of insects that do this, a few vertebrates that pollinate. I, I notice um, <clears throat> I hadn't I hadn't made the equation that moths go to the white, but when we go out with the kids in the, in the evening to chase the fireflies, there's you know it's usually where buckwheat's planted, and there's tons of moths in, uh -huh. in the buckwheat, and I had uh -huh. never actually you know considered so moths. Yeah, how they are helping the buckwheat set seed. Great. Um, so we'll have we'll have an invasive there in short time. <laughs> um, so I mean, it's clear that pollinators like they're critical, right? I mean, if we don't have them, we don't have food. So a lot of um, <clears throat> a lot of national stories that I've seen lately coming out about the decline of pollinator populations in er rural and, and urban areas. But I'm, I'm hoping you could talk a little bit about why this is important and why we as farmers and you know just people at home taking care of our yards be cognizant of how we're impacting pollinators they're, mm -hmm. they're critical to our e yeah, existence yeah. yeah well first of all many of the fruits and vegetables that we really like um, do uh, require pollination of some sort and uh, so we're talking everything from the Halloween pumpkin to a bowl of blueberries to um, apples and cherries and so forth um, we can also add in um, animal products uh, because alfalfa is an important part of the diet of beef cattle, dairy cattle, and some other livestock. Alfalfa is pollinated by various bee species, usually out west. Um, California, Nevada, Eastern Oregon, the alfalfa is grown for seed production. And that seed then is planted uh, various places all over the U.S. Uh, in order to grow alfalfa for seed production, you need honeybee colonies or other bee species. There are alkali bees, leafcutter bees that are managed out west for seed production. Okay, so then if we think uh, I'm going to have a, uh, a cheese sandwich, a bowl of yogurt, some ice cream, maybe a hamburger, we have to think back along the chain here, okay? Those uh, beef and dairy cattle ate some alfalfa as part of their diet. Yeah, alfalfa then originated from seed, which originated from pollinated flowers. Okay, so it, we do look at some um, a wide variety of foods that are important that, that do require some pollination, by typically by bee species, but occasionally by others.
a lot of our work in ecosystem services, this is what we would call a cornerstone species. I mean, it's, yeah. it's the foundation for everything. So I want to get into a little bit, most of our, our NCAT listeners are farmers, they're producers. So I want to talk a little bit about some, some practical applications. Um, and I'll just, for context, use the farm, right? My family has a small a small diversified farm. We're not organic um, certified, but we do follow the, the NOP um, when we make decisions about inputs or how we're treating a pest or any of that. Um, and we encourage and allow a lot of native plants to grow on our farm. But when we ran into each other, we were talking about buckwheat, which is uh, buckwheat and sunflowers, which are two that I use on my farm consistently. Um, probably buckwheat is our number one planted crop. Um, but what other type of um, plants or cover crops that farmers can sneak in that are, that are going to benefit these pollinators while we're trying to keep our soil from being bare and build biomass? Well, there's a lot of things we just consider to be weeds, um, roadside weeds that we don't think much about. For example, chicory is a little weed that grows along the roads out in the country. It's a blue flower. Um, and uh, if you watch carefully, you'll see bees going to chicory and they're collecting that, that pollen. Um, in early spring, typically around March, we see um, fields covered with sort of a magenta fl flower. And it's oftentimes in fallow fields, you know, where perhaps where corn has been grown and um, the corn hasn't come up yet. Uh, but it's, there's all this beautiful magenta flower and it's it's coming up by itself. People aren't planting it, okay? And that is called, um, sometimes it's called henbit, and it goes by other names. But bees will go to that, and they'll bring back this bright red pollen. And, uh, and that's important to the bees because it gets them going in the spring. March is really important for the pollinators to get out of the winter doldrums, get that protein and vitamin that's in the pollen. That's why they get it, because it's full of nutrients. And uh, all the pollinators um, that um, bring home pollen, including the bees, all the bees, rely heavily on the large amount of uh, protein, vitamins, minerals, and other nutrients that's in the pollen grain. So sometimes it sounds like sometimes doing nothing and letting just nature take the course is, that's, is a very positive. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Sometimes doing nothing. Another good time to do nothing, if you will, <laughs> is... <laughs> Um, is not doing anything to a, a, a naturally vegetated area, okay? Don't till it, don't mow it, just leave it alone because that's where many native bee species are nesting. Many native bees nest in the ground, okay? They dig tunnels um, that might go down for a foot or so um, and branch out. That's where the bee will place a ball of pollen and then lay an egg. The female bee goes down in their, into their tunnel finds one little offshoot of the tunnel, puts a ball of pollen, an egg, and then goes out for another pollen collection, put, goes down to another offshoot of that tunnel, puts a ball of pollen, and then an egg, and then goes away. When those eggs hatch, they become larvae. The larvae eat the pollen, and then out come the bees after a period of months. So by doing nothing, you're actually doing something pretty important. It's the, it's the developments, the subdivisions, the parking lots, the road cuts, the, anything that changes soil. And of course, a lot of agriculture, we're, we're tilling and planting, doing whatever we're doing, that also does destroy a native bee habitat. So if, the more that we can leave alone, the better off we are. Well, and that's, you know, that's so important. I'm so glad you brought that up. I mean, we, you know, and then it becomes back with the skill set there that you're looking for is more observational, right? I mean, we do that on our farm. We walk our farm daily and we observe where things are thriving naturally and where they're not. And sometimes we just say, we're not going there. This seems to be doing well. We have a, a forest-based pawpaw orchard on our farm that, you know, it's probably hundreds of years old that we've continued to toy around with whether to to open that up and make it more commercial, but it seems like there's a lot more uh, activity happening in there in, than in other parts of our farm. So we've just left it and sort of watch it and try to keep it clean and let it do its thing. So sometimes doing nothing and observing is is critical for the long term is what I took away from what you just said. Yeah, now pawpaw is pollinated by flies and beetles, by the way. You probably will never see a bee on a pawpaw flower. 
Uh, now that you say it, I've, I've never even seen bees in that little ecosystem on our, on our farm. I think that's, you know, that's one of the things when we, we farm that we do is, you know, we, we look at where there are different little ecosystems and try to piece together why and then how do we keep that unique space in and of itself without disturbing it. But I do want to go back to uh, technical production and, and um, you know, this year on, on our farm we're having a, a huge problem. We got a contract for some potatoes. Mm-hmm. which we usually plant very small <laughs> quantities, but we planted larger because of this contract. And um, that has increased our, our, beetle, our beetle pressures through the roof, and as such, we're, we're having to control those pests. Now, we're still controlling those pests organically, but, you know, these are in my production rows. So if I have next to my potatoes right now, I have a 100-foot row of buckwheat that I planted because carrots came out of there and we didn't want to leave bare ground. So what I'm hoping is that you can talk to me a little bit about when we use pesticides on the farm, how can we be careful that we're using them so that we're, and you may not know the answer to this, but I'm sure you have thoughts. Um, How do we protect the pollinators and make sure that we're we're being targeted and how far should we be away from buffers and things like that? We're spraying. What time should we be spraying? How can I make sure that trying to sell that crop, I'm not undoing the good I did with that pollinator strip. Right, right. Well, the most important thing is to remember that the bees go to flowers, okay? They don't go to potato leaves. They don't go to buckwheat leaves. They go to flowers. And um, so if you can apply your your insecticides or whatever it is on non-blooming plants, it'll be pretty safe, okay? And then, of course, be careful that the wind isn't blowing uh, strong and it's not going to the wrong place but and then you can do a little bit of research and see you know what actually happens what's the fate of that chemical does it break down in the soil does it evaporate does the sunlight uh, destroy it what's what's the long-term fate and then you can be much more thoughtful about doing it oftentimes people will spray in the evening so that there's all night when the pollinators are not flying and there's a um, chance for the, the chemical to do what it's supposed to do and then dissipate, degrade somewhat by morning, okay? And we all have to do a little bit of homework here, and so we go online, which we now have <laughs> this internet, which is pretty amazing, but we go online and say, what actually you know, happens to this particular substance that we're using, whether it's diatomaceous earth or whether it's something else, some synthetic chemical, something happens to it. Okay, yep. and, um, and so we need to do a little bit of homework and figure out, and I think we can be much, much more careful in protecting our pollinators if we apply to non-blooming plants and um, at the time of day when it's least likely to be a problem and then not when it's windy and so forth. Another uh, thing to think about, let's say you're, you've got an orchard, apples or whatever, well, what's blooming, what's underneath those, those trees? Are, are there dandelions and clover underneath the trees? Maybe the apples are not in bloom, but there are plants underneath that are in bloom, and the bees are going to those. So think carefully about blooming plants that are nearby. You know, one of the big things that we, uh, we advocate for at, at NCAT is this concept of whole farm planning, right? I mean, don't, you know, our decision-making process. So it almost sounds like my, my takeaway from this is when I'm planning my, not, not, not revenue planning, because we do a lot of that at NCAT as well, but production planning. I mean, it, it's, it's, I should be thinking about, well, what am I going to have a cover crop or a pollinator crop here next to another crop? And if we can integrate that sort of into our whole farm planning system, then we can do a lot better job protecting our our pollinators. And think also about which way the wind usually goes. Typically, the wind comes from the west, more or less. Um, Not always, but think about uh, wind breaks, uh, you know, hills, barns, and so forth that can block the wind, and then when you're applying some kind of a chemical, you sort of visualize your property and where that stuff is going to blow. And, and then think about your neighbors, too, because the person across the road may be doing something that you have no idea of understanding. <laughs> and we all need to be friends with our, our neighbors across the road and know what they're doing, because honeybees will fly for miles. Um, we've calculated that some of the bees at our KSU farm go for up to four miles to collect food. And how much of an area that is, if you sit down uh, with a map of your 
property and draw a three or four mile circle all the way around that. That is a lot of square miles, a lot of places where the bees could go and places where you maybe never have them. So think about the big picture because the bees can pick something up, good or bad, from a great distance. Well, and, it, and it, you know, it made me think too, the size of a bee, if we extrapolated that mm -hmm. to the size of a human, what would that three or four mile radius be? I mean, yeah, that would be and astronomical. Got, yeah, sit down with your calculator and figure that out. <coughs> no, weighs, the smarter minds yeah. than me. <laughs> well, you said a bee weighs a tenth of a gram, okay? Yeah. And we weigh, weigh, you know, probably between 100 and 200 pounds. Mm -hmm. uh, they might be carrying their own body weight in food and then come home and then go out and do it again. So, and non-stop, and I've seen them carrying yeah. their own body weight. It's fascinating yeah, yeah. to see them just covered in pollen. So it's astonishing that they um, can do all these things. Yeah. Well, that was my last question, Dr. Webster. I just, I just, if there's anything you want to add or anything that you think that um, farmers should know about yeah. pollinators, I mean, feel free to add it, but I, that was my last question for you. Well, you did mention sunflowers, which is maybe my favorite uh, plant, partly because they're beautiful, and there are all kinds of different colors of sunflowers, which are really cool, but you can notice that flowers are so big that one flower will have more than one type of pollinator on it, okay? You can maybe have three or four species of bee on a single sunflower head. So this can be a way of taking a census of the pollinators in your area, okay? So you go on and if you don't know the bee species, go take a camera or whatever, and, and check out what's on that sunflower head, and then another and another, okay? And then make sure you realize that, you know, six or seven in the morning is different than four in the afternoon, because bees are very sensitive to the time of day. Many pollinators will be to the flowers before dawn on a summer morning, because that's the logical time to do the work, right? And, that, and then the plants likewise make their pollen and nectar, nectar is a sweet sugary liquid that the plants offer, um, make it available early and then curl up and when the sun comes up. I've seen on summer mornings there's a pumpkin uh, plant in my, my yard um, will open its flowers in the summer before dawn and there will be some squash bees down there in the bottom of the flower doing their thing and then when the sun comes up shortly after that the bees go home the flower closes and waits until the next morning. So you can see it's all designed to be efficient, to conserve water, uh, and to, for the bee and the plant, for them to be good to each other. So you can use uh, squashes and pumpkins and so forth, and sunflowers are very good to use for making a census of what you have in your area. And then um, do a little bit of homework, you can figure out that there's different kinds of bees and you don't have to know exactly what they are, but see how you're doing year by year and location by location and that will tell you if you're doing all right okay if you're doing a good job of protecting those pollinators they will show up on the sunflowers and you can stagger your sunflower plantings it takes about 60 days seed to bloom for a sunflower so you can plant some in the beginning of may beginning of june beginning of july and so forth so you have a through the summer you've got bloom um, to to use for this also, many pollinators struggle during drought periods. Sunflowers and buckwheat are deep rooted and they continue to offer nectar in a dry time in July and August when it's dry. And that's really, really important for them to have that food during that time. So that's, that's another reason I like buckwheat and sunflowers. Well, that's, I, I really appreciate you taking the, the time with me. I've already learned so much and thought about six other things we can yeah. do now. I hope you do again. Um, yeah, so I, I hope to do this again. And, um, you know, Dr. Webster, thank you so much. I'm fortunate to have Dr. Webster here from Kentucky State University. If you have any questions about pollinators, uh, Dr. Webster's your guy. He works here in Extension at KSU, and uh, he's pretty easy to find. I found him, so you can too. Dr. Yeah. Webster, thank you so much, sure, and I pleasure. appreciate you. That's it for this episode. Thanks for listening. Additional information about this episode and related resources can be found at atra.incat.org. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe to Voices from the Field wherever you get your podcasts. I'm your host, Rich Myers. ATRA, Voices from the Field, is produced by the National Center for Appropriate Technology, headquartered in Butte, Montana.
It's supported by the USDA Rural Business Cooperative Service as part of NCAT's ATRA Sustainable Agriculture Program. Any opinions, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this recording are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of the USDA or NCAT. We'll catch you again next week, and until then, keep on farming.